Welcome to Chopping It Up with Buck. I got my man Colin Cole. We're going to have a draft recap because, you know, when the draft comes, Colin, I don't know how the NFL does this, man. They pick names and they have people from all over the world watching people pick names. I still don't understand that. This draft thing has become crazy. But, hey, this year's experience was a wild ride for a lot of folks in KC. And I think Kansas City, having won the Super Bowl, man, what would that have been like? Had the Panthers had a draft and won the Super Bowl? Can you just let's let's talk a little bit about that because that's a, that's got to be an awesome thing, man. Well, well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Buck. I'm looking forward to the show, man. You know, I, I think that uh, when we, we talk about that, you, you asked that question specifically. What would it be like to have to host? the draft after winning the Super Bowl. I mean, you saw those guys was parading the Super Bowl, the, the Lombardi yeah. trophy around. You saw those guys were, were jubilant and enjoying themselves, man. That's probably exactly what you would get here in Carolina. Yeah. You posted a, 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 a draft right after right after winning the Super Bowl. But, you know, it was a tremendous opportunity, obviously, for the city of Kansas City uh, to be able to host that as well as to be able to kind of have a little bit of a uh, – you know, it was just beautiful. You know, it had yeah. a great- yeah. We had great participation by all the fans. It was awesome. You know, the one thing I love about uh, well, fans is they don't care. Like, they, no. they <laughs> every time a Raiders, uh, somebody representing the Raiders came up, yeah, the yeah. Bulls, the Chargers, you know, everything, yeah. everybody from that West, they were definitely letting yeah. out, which I love about this sport. I love the fact that our, that, the, that the football fans don't, they're not afraid to let their 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 love for their team shine through, and that's what they did on on draft night. And you know, just and that was just the side show. You know, obviously yeah. the main show was was those young men's names that were being called. And I know we're gonna get into that, man. But it was a tremendous tremendous weekend. Well, you bring up a really good point. I'm wearing the Oilers hat for all you Titans fans. This is love your blue. This goes back to Earl Campbell when he was running over people. You know, I, I grew up, man. I love the Oilers so. Maybe when I got drafted, I was thinking maybe the Oilers, but it didn't happen. I'm thankful to the Saints and the Colts, and we'll talk about that a little bit too later. But, man, let's get into the Panthers' picks. I'm really interested to get your opinion from a defensive line perspective and a defensive guy perspective. The first player pick, was it the right thing to pick Bryce Young? And what if it wasn't the right thing, who should they have picked at that first spot? Man, you know, what's interesting about that is I got that question a lot, you know, whether it be in the gym or the grocery store and all over the place in Chicago, it was people asking, man, what you, what you think you're going to pick? Uh, who do you think the Panthers are going to pick first? And, you know, the popular pick was Bryce Young. And to be honest with you, before this last season, I didn't watch much of him, didn't know much about him, and even going throughout the season. But uh, the young man has a rocket for an arm, has all the intangibles that you're looking for in a quarterback other than the height requirement or I should yeah. say, lack thereof because I think that the trend of quarterbacks has gone in a different direction over the last number of years and having somebody who can obviously break down a defense extend the play has become more of a priority for for teams and for offenses so it's really you know it's it's um I can't say a crapshoot because you know there yeah, was yeah. there are a few good quarterbacks that were coming out in this draft but uh he stood among all of them. He, he really stood out among all of them. And considering the competition that he went against in the SEC on uh, on the West side over there, it was uh, obviously on a weekly basis. He had to go up against top tier cap, top caliber competition. Yeah. And um, the young man performed very well. And so uh, not not to mention some of those tests that they put together, some of those quarterback tests, all that kind of stuff, you know, lightening up on the, uh, the blackboard, which, you know, offensively, those quarterbacks have to be able to to, to, to go into depth and detail about certain aspects of the offense and whatnot. And offensive coordinators are looking for that kind of intelligence in a quarterback. And he obviously shined with all, all colors. And it's interesting to see that, um, you know, he's the first Alabama quarterback to be drafted first overall. And yeah, uh, you know, it's, it, it, the other thing is that uh, that Alabama quarterback's room has been pretty tremendous over the last couple of years, producing players such as um, – who, who do we have? Mac Jones up there in New England. You got Jalen Hurts over in in Philly, who was for a second there the highest paid quarterback, the highest paid player in, in, in the NFL. So there is uh, not to mention my man down there in Miami. So there there is the, something about those Alabama quarterbacks, and they're doing a tremendous job of putting them out. And this young man does not fall short from that uh, that tree. Well, one question you, you bring up a really good point, and there's a few things that that I saw of him in college really poised, always calm, always looking down the field, never took any big shots, even though he's smaller in stature. 
Uh, he's got an offensive coordinator in Thomas Brown, Frank Reich, former quarterback, Josh McCown, the quarterback coach. You've got Jim Caldwell, a former quarterback guru also. So you got, you, you've got him surrounded in the cocoon of quarterback mentality, right? But my question for you from a defensive line perspective is shorter stature. I can remember when Steph Curry was coming out, oh, he's not he's going to be too small, too slight a frame. Well, all these years later, we're seeing Steph Curry. So I don't want to compare and put that pressure on that young man. But you saw Drew Brees live. You saw Russell Wilson live. Mm -hmm. I knew Russell Wilson was going to be a really good quarterback watching him at college just because of how he moved and the angles that he could do. And Bryce has some of that. What do you see? What did you see when you played Drew Brees, a shorter and statue guy, and a a uh, a guy like you know who we were talking about, Russell Wilson, to compare to Bryce Young just a little bit? So I'll even go in throughout my career. Um, we talk about Drew Brees. We talk about uh, Russell Wilson. We played those two teams, New uh, New Orleans and Seattle. But one thing about those teams is that they made a they made very sure they made a they did a tremendous job of shoring up their offensive front, um, especially when it came to the the center and the two guards. When it came to those three guys on the offensive line stomping, I would say stomping, but stalemating yeah. mating uh, defensive linemen's upfield pressure, creating it creating a firm pocket pocket up front for the quarterback to be able to step up. That's what really created uh, Drew Brees' success as well as Russell Wilson. Uh, I would say that both of those staffs understood that as a shorter stature quarterback that you're going to lean on, you got to make sure that the pocket in front of them is is short up so that they don't get that in their face kind of pressure because obviously it's a little bit more difficult for them to see over the pressure, right? So you want to make sure that you sure up that side of the pocket. So here in Carolina, that's going to be the main focus is creating a a pocket for him with uh, offensive linemen clearly that can uh, surround him and make their U shape between the offensive tackles creating that outside edges, but those three guys on the interior making sure that they keep that defensive front from collapsing the pocket and getting in his lap. So, and then once they get into his lap, it makes it a lot easier for those guys to bat balls down, you know, and create, create negative play. So I think that uh, for them to make sure that he is the most comfortable and to be the most accurate and most be able to have the most success as a quarterback, you got to make sure that those three positions, the center and both guard positions, are the most stout that they could possibly be, so that they, he doesn't have to worry about getting any pressure in his face or bat or passes batted down. The other thing is what I saw in Arizona. Um, I can't think of his name, but they run a lot more quarterback um, shotgun plays. They don't run a whole lot under center. So Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray, five eight, five nine, five ten. So you yeah. have to do more. He has to do more out of the pocket, out of, out of the shotgun. So he's not, you know, taking taking. The, the direct snap from under center and then dropping back five to seven yards because then you're still at a deficit. So getting an opportunity to see the entire field is uh, what they did for him. I, I wouldn't be surprised they do something similar here, but uh, we saw the success that both Drew Brees and Russell Wilson have have had throughout their career. Just like you mentioned, they played from under center as well as in the shotgun. They played from every for every spot in that backfield. So my biggest keys for him and his success. Obviously, you got to surround him with all the tools to get the ball out to him, but to keep him upright and healthy, mm -hmm. make sure that those three guys on the interior offensive line are solid and sured up for him. Well, ADSN's Kevin Tolbert was on hand in Kansas City, and he got the first interview with Bryce Young. So let's go to that real quick, and we'll come back and talk on the back side of that. Bryce, you've had a lot of mentors over the years uh, getting you through the different phases. Uh, so at the QB position, who has been your biggest mentor to get you through these big steps from Alabama to now to the N NFL? Yeah, you know, I've been blessed to have, have been working with the same guys um, quarterback-wise for since I was in eighth grade. Um, you know, Taylor Kelly um, was someone that was here with me today, is someone I've, who I've been working with since then, him and uh, everyone else at 3DQB. And, you know, they've really they've worked with a lot of other guys in, in the league and a lot of other guys that had success. And, you know, on the field, you know, they, they've really pushed me and allowed me to, you know, be who I am on the field. And um, the team has beefed up both the roster and the coaching staff, all with the idea of building you up to make you successful as quickly as possible. How does that feel knowing the organization has done that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a 
it's a it's an honor and it's it's great to be in a, an organization that, that has you know the planning of, of building everything up and you know I was able to talk to the front office on my visit of the plan that they've had in place and had in place for a while now and you know I want to do my job to come in and, and help however they they want me to, to 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 do everything I can to help the team reach those team goals that we have set and um, you know really it's it, it's an honor to be able to be in, in an organization like Carolina. I'm going to give it my all, um, give it everything I have. Um, you know, this is, I'm forever grateful and, and forever indebted for, for them believing in me in this. And, you know, I'm going to do everything I can um, and, and give my all to make sure that, you know, I can rep I represent the Carolina Panthers the best that I can. So, Colin, you can clearly see the young man is poised. He's, he's, he's done this all his whole career at modern day in high school, at Alabama. He's just, you know, just one of those guys that when you read articles and you hear about just how he has this maturity factor about him. And it, it's interesting to watch to see how he can take over that locker room. I love what you said about being rugged up the middle. Because if you're not good in that center guard area, you know as well as I do, because you, you live your life in that area. They've got to make sure they secure that area for him. But what I like about him already is his ability, and Bill O'Brien said it best at Alabama, Bill O'Brien, who was office coordinator in the NFL, now back with the Patriots, that said he's one of the smartest guys he's ever been around. And Bill O'Brien is not one of those guys to give much credit to people. And he sometimes can be an asshole. Let's just be real. <laughs> but he said this about him as his offensive coordinator at Alabama. How do you feel that intelligence factor will translate over? Because I, I, I want to get back to Curry because I think it's, it's a good analogy of an undersized guy, smaller in stature, and we automatically think, they can't handle the rigors of whatever it is. He just seems to have that it factor. I'm interested to see how that translates in the locker room. Man, I, I think for, for this young man, it really um, – we already talked about the coaching staff that has been put together by Frank Reich uh, to surround him and to, to ensure his success. But I think the bigger part of it all is that, you know, he's had this time to grow in these different systems and really uh, – find his way and you know you mentioned all of the success that he's had you know on, on these various levels but um here in the nfl one of the things that i concern myself with, let me be honest with you be honest okay. with you, yeah. one of the things that i worry about for young quarterbacks is coming in and being put in the fire right away and not have an opportunity to really adjust to the speed of the nfl the nfl is faster than college just like college is faster than high school just like high school is faster than pop warner so on and so forth so I personally find that quarterbacks that have the opportunity to have a year or two or however long to sit uh, behind a starter, give them opportunity to not have that pressure on them right away. Case in point, my opportunity in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, I played four, five years there. Four of those years with Brett Favre, the, the fifth year Aaron Rodgers stepped in, but that was three years after he had been drafted. You know, he had that opportunity to get to know the playbook. So when he had the opportunity to get in and step in, even when he had to relieve Brett in injury, when he, he stepped in in the game um, in 2007 or whatever, he he showed that he he picked up the playbook and he pre he did pretty well. So for Bryce, my only worry is that he doesn't have a veteran quarterback ahead of him to kind of you know to, to for him to kind of learn the ropes from. But on the flip side of that, this is Frank Reich's first season. So any quarterback that was on the roster is going to definitely be at the same level of, of, of Bryce in terms of learning the playbook. So it's kind of twofold. It's kind of twofold in that regard. But it's, it's really going to come down to his ability to learn and absorb. And with some great minds around him, you, you mentioned um, Luke McCown, Josh McCown. You also mentioned Jim Caldwell, who I got to say, an Iowa alumni, who, who is a tremendous coach as well, who uh, should be a head coach, but uh, is going to be a tremendous assistant on the staff and assisting this young man to, to reach his highest potential. Yeah, so you bring up some really good points. The other part that I think is really key is Andy Dalton is on the staff, or is on the roster, so that does give them at least that veteran leadership, right? And you said it best. Patrick Mahomes was one of the guys that said this. He said, Alex Smith was invaluable to my learning process from college to the pros. And we think of Patrick Mahomes as the finished product. So there's going to be some transition and some struggle. We'll talk about that a little bit after we go through some of these other folks. But I want to talk about them getting a weapon for him in the second round. Jonathan Mingo, who I think was one of those under-the-radar guys all year out of Ole Miss. I think he really plays the game well, plays hard, 
with DJ Morgan, Thielen coming in, who's got some age on him, but still a, a, a really good weapon. Terrence Marshall, but Mingo. How do you feel this Jonathan Mingo pick was? You get your quarterback, QB1. Now you got to get a couple of weapons to replace some of the guys that you lost. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you think about it, and I was concerned because, you know, they traded away their number one receiver, you know, yeah. DJ yeah. Moore to the Chicago. And so it's like, who is going to step into that role? We saw that they added added Adam Thielen. But it's like, okay, Adam Thielen is getting a little bit long in the tooth in terms of what the receiver position is. So, yes, in comes Jonathan Mingo. But before I jump on him, I like Terrace Marshall. I think he's got some great size and great size. I, I do, too. I do. I, did, did they not use him correctly? or You, you know, I, I just thought he was – I really have been waiting to see him take that next step for the Panthers. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, yeah I think it, I'm not here to talk about anybody specifically other than the fact that, you know, coaching really makes brings the best out of everybody. Amen. So, all I'm going to say in that regard is that, you know, with the staff that is in place right now with uh, Frank Reich, who is an uh, offensive minded guy, I would hope to see that he takes another step. But when we talk about Jonathan Mingo, this young man out of Ole Miss was a tremendous receiver for that Ole Miss unit. Uh, his production increased as a sophomore and, and throughout his seat, throughout his career there, he's, he increased every single year. So his, his uh, vertical abilities, uh, the, the the receiving yards, the receiving touchdowns, his touch, you know, all of it. He brings a total package to this uh, to this to this draft class. And you know, just like I mentioned earlier, you got to make sure you surround Bryce with all the weapons. I can't just say Bryce, but you got to make sure you surround this offense with as many possible weapons as you can. And adding a speedster like uh, Jonathan Mingo is uh, is going to be tremendous for this receiving core. Well, and I also think you know, with this is all is another thing. It's going to get some run. And I don't think he was utilized all the time the way he could be in that offense. I know Frank will. They'll really do some things with, with this offense. And Thomas Brown is one of those guys. And I really like how they game plan and how they move people in the right position. So as we look at the next pick, you know, it wasn't a whole lot of draft picks, but you got to look at the qualities of the quantity. But if you go into the third round, they got an Ed Rusher, DJ Johnson out of Oregon. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about him and what you can think uh, of what he would be able to do well this is another young man um you know you can never have enough edge rushers you can never have enough guys up front to really bolster your, your front you, you may mention to brian burns we know he is he is a pro bowler for any pro bowler now and uh one of the standouts and key uh pillars of the uh, panthers defense so He's going to take that next step. Who's going to help get pressure alongside of him? Who's going to help bolster that line alongside Derek Brown? Uh, they go out to the to the Pacific Northwest, to Oregon, to Eugene, and snatch up this young man, this young edge rusher, DJ Johnson, who has a tremendous motor, um, a very inspiring young man who is uh, who has done a tremendous job at his collegiate level. Uh, another guy, this young man actually started his career at the University of Miami. Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw I, I saw him play at Miami, and actually, he was really one of those guys that did a nice job in Miami. And then when he transitioned out west, he may have, you know some people might have lost touch with him, but I kind of kept an eye on him because he was one of those guys that played, you know, really highly recruited kid coming out of school, but just one of those guys that uh, you know just always showed up on tape, kind of flashed every time I watched tape. Play. Yeah, and I saw the same thing. He's definitely a young man that flashed. He made a decision, obviously, to leave the U and head all the way to the opposite corner of the country <laughs> um, to find his next niche. But uh, I think that he did so in the Pac-12, and he's going to do so here with the Carolina Panthers. Another tool uh, to this defense that's going to be a great edge rusher and, and grow into somebody who can be dependable for this defense. What I do like about him, Colin, they played a little tight end, too. Show some versatility, <laughs> baby. Show some versatility, man. I feel you, know, I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> you got to give them credit. You know, I'm gonna give them tight ends some love whenever I can. Yes, sir. So, so, man, thinking back to your draft experience, you know, I, I know you were undrafted free agent, played a, a goo guy of the years, like 15, 20 years in the league. What was the draft experience for you like? What was the combine? Just give, walk us through that because I've heard the story and you and I've talked about it, but I don't think people realize what you had to go through just to get to the league and then what you had to do as a single year to make it. That draft piece, I'm, I'm interested to hear your story. 
Man, man, Buck, I appreciate that. So, you know, I would say the draft for me every year is kind of bittersweet. You know, it gets a, it's an opportunity, obviously, to see these young men who have worked so hard to to realize their dreams and get their name called. It's a tremendous opportunity and it's a, a tremendous accolade to add to a culmination of hard work that you've done throughout your high school, college careers to get to that point. So it's uh, like I said, it's bittersweet for me because I, I worked you know, I, I had the opportunity to do some of those things, like you mentioned, the Senior Bowl, uh, the Combine, and uh, all that good stuff. And so it was, it was, uh, it was difficult to sit there and watch all those rounds. You know, I would say it's tough because you know every year there are a specific position group that uh, that comes out, and you see a lot of them go. So. The year of 2003 in my draft class was the year that there were about 16 defensive linemen that were drafted in the first round. And, you know, a lot of guys that were drafted in the first three rounds. So it really, you know, it made it for those rosters to be full by the time it got to the end of the of the draft. So it was uh, it was one thing to not hear my voice, hear my name called. However, uh, it was definitely I wouldn't take my experience back or change it because I, I feel like that's really what pushed me to to strive to to make it 13 years in the NFL. You know, I think he's a, a hell of a motivator and a hell of a drive for me uh, in my career. CC, I bet you you can name every one of those guys that went before you. Every one of the guys in the draft. I'm sure you want. Now, let me just ask you this. Did any of them play as long as you? You don't have to name names, but did any of them play as long as you did? Uh, no, no, definitely not. <laughs> and that's, that, that's the other thing, too, Buck, is, is my thing is with this draft, man, I, I love the league, love the NFL, you yeah. know, and you and I know, you know, back in the day, it used to just be in some some old uh, conference room, you know, with a bunch of cigarette smoke and a bunch yeah. of guys, like, you know, just sitting around. It was never as glitzy and glamorous as it is right now. And they make it to be that way. And I, I, I applaud the NFL because their marketing and their management teams, they understand how to best market the NFL. But yeah. – Let's be honest. Let's be honest. More than half of those young men that heard their name called on that first day won't be in the league for five years. They right. will not make it five years. A lot of them are complacent because they get the money. A lot of them, you know, whatever the case may be, I don't know. But um, when you are a young, when you're a guy that has that drive, you know, you push to make that career as long as you can. So it it is what it is. You know, I, I stand on what I say with, with regards to that. But, you know, it, it's still, you know, it is, it is like I said before, a culmination of all the hard work that yeah. they guys put in. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to be able to be a part of. Colin, the, the team's rosters are built with middle. I was a fifth-round pick. You were undrafted three. There's so many guys. You know, I can just – I won't even name names. But one of the things, when did you know? your rookie year that you were going to make that team? When did you feel in your heart of hearts? Because I, I can I can kind of tell you my story about it, but when was your, when did you feel like, hey, I'm here, I'm competing, I don't give a shit about that guy, that guy, I'm making this team, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to fight every year to do that? Man, I, I guess it would be somewhere around that second, first, second preseason game where I, I realized that, hey, man, you know, I'm, these guys I'm playing against, they're, you know, is this is still just football. This is still exactly. something I've been exactly. doing for you know however many years up to that point. So it's it's nothing any different. It's just yeah. speed it up. It's 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 bigger guys. It's stronger yeah. guys. That's it. Other than that, it's still just a game of football. So it, it it took a little bit of time to get my footing and get comfortable. But it yeah. uh, after that, uh, that uh, after that first year, I really found myself understanding that yo, this is this is where I belong, and it just came yeah. down to, to working to to make it my reality. For me, it was the first preseason game against the Raiders. We got to practice against them with Howie Long and, you know, all the Sean Jones, all the guys they had on defense. But I was practicing every day against Von Johnson, Sam Mills, Ricky Jackson, Pat Swiller, and that whole Dome Patrol defense. So there were some days of practice, bro. I was like, if this is going to be the way it is every day, I, I, your boy got to learn how to do this right. But that first game went out. Had you know, because they really were, they wanted me to block better, and I learned that quickly. I said, okay, I was spending time after practice, so I learned how to do that in that offense. But I caught like three passes for about seventy yards, and I said, I can play in this. Game. I know I can. And the and it was against some of the Raiders, not just their backups, but some of their starters too. And I think that was the part for me that said, I, I can do this. I can do this consistently. 
Well, during the, the draft, the NFL tries to engage in the community on different levels. This year, the league held several football clinics. You know how they do all those great things in the community. One of the clinics feature opportunities for special needs athletes to participate in off-field dr uh, drills. And the special needs event is also something near and dear to heart of Grayson Hunt, the daughter of chief owner Clark Hunt. Let's take a look at what Gracie and Kevin and all those guys got to do that we didn't get to do at this year's draft in Kansas City. The NFL is committed to its fans, all ages, all sizes, including Special Olympians that are out here today participating in one of the football camps. It's an amazing experience. They've done such a great job of creating that really close fan experience for everybody involved. This is amazing. Well, thank you. We appreciate it, you know, for us to come here. And when our CEO, John Larry, organized this all up and said the NFL was, was helping and sponsoring Special Olympics and we was going to be part of it, then we was all excited. It's so much fun for Kansas City coming off of a Chiefs Super Bowl win. I don't know if that's ever happened before where you, the team wins the Super Bowl and then you get to host the draft that same year. We're so fortunate and you can just feel the energy within the city. Fans are so excited and we're glad that the NFL is putting on events like the NFL Community Clinics Day today. I first started working with them when I was back in high school, so it's been over a decade now, which is so hard to believe. Um, and the president of Special Olympics Kansas, John Lair, who we have here, and I got connected several years back. Um, and he's really worked so hard on so many of the flag football initiatives that we have partnered with the Kansas City Chiefs. I think it's a great opportunity for our kids, and they really look forward to events and stuff like this, getting to be a part of the community and all of the activities that um, everybody else does. Um, the NFL and the MLB have been great in our area. No matter who you are, you can pursue your dreams. It doesn't matter what you might think could impede that, but if you believe in your ability and you work like you're in charge and pray like God's in charge, you can do anything you set your mind to. They're able to be themselves. Just celebrate out here and have a good time. We're so excited about having the draft in Kansas City and this is a big part of it because our athletes are included. If I had brought my sneakers, you might see me out there. I used up most of my coordination back on my soccer days, so I really stick to just running, but I've so enjoyed watching all of these athletes just crush it out there. One, two, three! You're off to that next football. So Colin, that's great. I love the features with Gracie Hunt and that group. They were doing a nice job, but let's get back to a little football. We talked about building the interior of your offensive line. So what the Panthers do? They go get a guard, Chandler Zavala, who, you know, is from a Division II school. And, you know, play, he started there and then transferred, you know, just one of those guys that was not a highly recruited guy, but worked his way into a fourth round pick. And this comes on the heels of getting icky last year. So what do you think about the, the pick for Chandler Zavala in the fourth round? Well, just like I said, you know, you have to be able to protect quarterbacks specifically in the pocket. You got to be able to uh, create stalemates at the at the defensive line on the line of scrimmage. Um, and what does the Panthers do? They go out and get uh, just like you mentioned um, the last year's former first round pick. They get his former teammate from NC State, yep. uh, and this is a this is a young man who's a big guy and. Uh, it, like you mentioned, he came from a Division II school, so a very hungry young man who has a lot of uh, upside in his future. Um, he, he earned first-team All-ACC accolades. He's uh, he's he's going to be a tremendous left guard for this group. And it, it's funny because he's going to be playing, lining up right next to his former team. So, <laughs> Isn't that cool? Hey, look, I'm going to tell you, these, I saw these two at NC State actually play together, and they both have some dog in them. And I think, you know, Icky is still learning the game, but I'm going to tell you, Icky is highly talented, the kid that came out of Charlotte, North Carolina. I got to see him in high school. But Chandler, you know, even though he was a, a initial D2 pick, this kid, man, they talk about a guy that just, y'all, like y'all would have been fighting all game long. And that's, you know, that's just the kind of guy he is when you watch the tape, man. And I know you have a healthy amount of respect. I don't want to tussle with you even now. You know, I look at you, I'm like, look, I'm going to come over there. If I don't wham block you, I'm just going to touch you and try to keep going. <laughs> but this is, yeah, yeah. This, but this guy right here, 
I think is one of those that we're going to talk that they can plug in and give your offensive line. You want to have eight to nine offensive linemen that you can move around. And if you want to keep the tackles the same, you know this, but you want to have that. You want to have the same thing on your defensive line. You want to be strong up front. And I think this is a good pick for the Panthers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, yeah. you, should make a, you make a great point. You want to have five guys solid for the entire season. And then whoever you have in terms of additions, and in terms of your roster, you want to be able to have those guys be swing guys and be able to put all those other positions. So great pick for the Panthers in the fourth round. Yeah. Now, the other thing is the fifth round has been great for the Panthers. You know, a lot of people think about first and second round. Let's think about some of the fifth round picks they've had. Less, or just historic fifth round picks. Lester Hayes, uh, Hardy Nickerson, uh, Joe Horn, Richard Sherman, Tyreek Hill. There have been some really good fifth round pick. So when you get to Jimmy Rob Jamie Robinson, what do you think about this pick for the Panthers and that that, that Florida State uh combination that comes out of this young man? You know, it's um it's it's, it's wild. You know, I grew up a Florida State fan. Let me say that first and foremost growing up in South Florida. I grew up a Florida State fan, Seminole fan, Bobby Bowden um work done charlie ward all those guys and out of the same mode you get this young man jamie robinson out of fsu who is uh he was an sec all freshman back in 2019 uh he played in, in, in 12 games uh that same year he's got he's at increased um increased his his his, his output throughout his career uh, he had 62 tackles that year. He followed up with 74 in 2020, 2020. He had 11 starts last year. All ACC accolades as a as a defensive back, as a safety. The young man can get around the field. And when you talk about um, you talk about these late rounds, you talk about the fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth round. You're looking for guys that can round out your team. You're looking guys yeah. for guys that can be contributors on all four core special teams. You're looking for guys that can that you can plug in in various positions on the defense. And Jamie Robinson fits that bill. He's a guy that can come in and be a four core special teams player who can start on all of those on all of those and be a guy that's going to be a contributor uh, for years to come. So I think that this staff did a tremendous job in, in going and scouting and finding this young man out of Florida State who will bolster not only their special teams, but when he has his opportunity on the defense, he's going to be ready to go. I got to go back to Lester Hayes, old Stickham days. Hardy Nickerson, I played against Hardy in college. Hardy mm -hmm. talked the most. They, you know, they talk about Joey Porter talking trash. Hardy talked trash from the beginning to the end, even if they were getting beat. I mean, and he was a fifth round pick like me, one twenty two. I was one twenty five, so that was good. <laughs> that that made me laugh when our research department came up with that one. Man, that's a good one right there. <laughs> well, I had the opportunity to meet Hardy Nickerson one time at an NFL event. It was a great, dude. Uh, yeah, real real well spoken cat man. But when between those lines, dude, Hardy does not stop. And it, it's funny that that, that uh, he was a fifth round pick as well. Hey. So we talked about undrafted free agents. Let's go back to that. There's some guys here that the Panthers selected that I think uh, will round out the roster. Will they, you know, when you look at some of these names, who are a few that just kind of stand out to you from your, your experience of being in that position and having to fight through and, and show, your, show your wares to the team? Man, as you know, Buck, I already mentioned being an undrafted free agent. You mentioned it. These are guys that definitely hold a piece of my heart much more yeah. dear than anything because these guys are fighting. They're fighting from the time they get off the plane in in in, in the Queen City to the time that you know the, there ain't gonna be no press conference for them, right? This is gonna be <laughs> no, they, they, don't, they don't come in. They don't come in in the cover of night. Nobody gonna know nothing about them. They're gonna show up and one day they got on a jersey and it's gonna be some odd number. It's gonna be like a thirty nine or yeah. a sixty seven or something like that. But you have an opportunity. So that's all we wanted was an opportunity, and they have that. And so with this, I look for this group of guys. I could be honest with you. Uh, Josh Van, I got to see a little bit play down in South Carolina. Um, Cam Peoples out of App State, I got to see just a little bit. Uh, the rest now, of Cam Peoples, I'll say I saw him live. Yeah. And he's, a, he's a dude that's put together well. I think he's going to make a difference uh, because – when you need a, when you have the, the quarterback that's a little bit shorter in stature, needs some running, a good running game. I think Cam Peoples is one of those that surprised me. I thought he would get drafted, but since he didn't, I think this is a good place for him to land and try to make this ball go. Yeah, he's definitely in a in the right place in terms of having the opportunity. So 
Look for him to to, to step up. Uh, North Dakota State, uh, Nash Jensen's another offensive guard. Mm-hmm. North Dakota State has, has sleepily over the last number of years put out some really good talent. And you know, we got to go back to Carson Wentz, who was uh, who was a quarterback there for a number of years ago. They have done a tremendous job of putting out talent. There's a number of other guys I can't even get into right now, but. Yeah, I like to see what uh, what what he's able to do, and yeah, I don't, I can't say I know every name on this list, but I know that uh, these young men have are coming into a situation. If I can speak for myself specifically, you come into a situation where you're just looking for an opportunity, and you're very hungry, especially with this being your dream, and you've you've wanted this for a long time. You got to take advantage. So I'm looking forward to seeing who out of this group steps up to the plate and who makes that final roster. Man, well said, CC. Well, man, good to have you on. Good to be on with you again. And it's good to talk about the draft because, like I said, you said it best. It used to be a bunch of cigars and uh, cigarettes in a dark, seedy room, just giving cards to the commissioner. Now it's just a full blown thing. But I do think it's just, it's fun to watch. The league has turned this into a, a great event. And I think that's why we're able to talk about it and have, you know, conversation about it, even when you're not playing a game. So, uh, you know, I, I really like that you could come on today and spend some time with us and really share the story of, you know, how you made it and, and what it took to get to to where you got to and that did. That'll do it for this post-draft edition of Chopping It Up with Buck. Hey, be sure to log on to the ADSN1.com for all your Carolina Panthers news, updates, and feature content all season long. Chopping It Up with Buck is there all the time. And Colin Cole, my good friend, will do it again, my man. Your D tackle, I'm a tight end, but I still got love for you. <laughs> Brothers, regardless, baby. Yeah, <laughs> All right, man.